America has already lost a cheap war with China. To understand why, we have to go back to the origin story. The semiconductor was never just an industry. It was built as an instrument of state power. It's an architecture that assigned rules and choke points in ways that time and scale eventually turn against Washington itself. Silicon is one of the most common elements on Earth, scattered through sand, rock, and dust. Refined with capital, engineering, and time, it becomes the most valuable material of the digital age. It's a base layer of the microchips. That journey from the uh, geological abundance to strategic scarcity is what turns semiconductors into a currency of power. From day one, chips were not just commercial gadgets. They were the tools of the states. The modern semiconductor industry wasn't born in a garage. It was born in the Pentagon's panic after a Sputnik movement from the Soviet Union. U.S. defense agencies, NASA, and later DARPA poured money into microelectronics. Missile programs and space projects became the first mass buyers of the integrated circuits. By the 1970s, most of America's cheap R&D was still directly or indirectly funded by Washington. More slow was riding on the mission-driven public capital long before it became a slogan for the private innovation. When the demand exploded in the 1980s and 1990s, Washington didn't simply let the market globalize. It engineered a fragmented stack. Memory production was notched to Japan, then to South Korea. The leading edge fabrication was spun out of China's Taiwan province, where the TSMC, backed by um, state planners and US technology licensing, pioneered this pure foundry model. American firms keep the design and the IP, while the dirty, expensive manufacturing was pushed offshore. By the early 2000s, the map was set the United States sat on top of the software, design tools, and capital. Japan and Europe controlled the uh, critical equipment and materials. Taiwan and South Korea ran the fabs as the dependable manufacturing hubs, while the mainland China was locked at the bottom of this hierarchy, assembly, packaging, and end market consumption. These are deliberately fenced out of leadership roles and cutting edge tools by Washington. So this was never globalization in the literal sense. It was only a managed ecosystem. It's a cheap stack built to concentrate the control in the hands of a small circle of states and allies. For much of the post-WTO era, Washington treated China's tech rise as a sideshow. Market access was tolerated. Joint ventures were encouraged. The US brands from Nike to GM chased the demands across mainland China. The assumption in the Western capital was simple. If China was plugged into global markets, it would gradually be socialized into a US-led world order. But between 2015 and 2018, that assumption collapsed. China's Huawei's 5G rollout outpaced the Ericsson and Nokia on cost, reliability, and scale, with no American rival in sight. It signaled something deeper. An edge in foundational systems could be converted into geopolitical leverage. Beijing stopped whispering its ambitions. So the Made in China 2025 laid out the explicit targets in AI, quantum, aerospace, and semiconductors. To American policymakers, it reads less like a developmental plan and more like a declaration of the ultimate intent. The US intelligence community reclassified China's innovation drive as a security risk. Commerce was redefined as strategy. The rule book flipped from the liberal interdependence to the managed vulnerability. It wasn't that China suddenly changed the game. It was Washington that rewrote the rules once its own monopoly were under threat. The uncomfortable truth is that America had already lost its strategic initiative by the time it moved to weaponize their interdependence on the supply chains. Technology containment only arrived after China had proved that it could outperform at scale. The crackdown on Huawei became a live fire test. In May 2019, the US Commerce Department placed Huawei on the entity list, cutting it off from the key American technologies like chipsets, software, operating systems. In year 2020, the foreign direct product rule pushed the US jurisdiction far beyond the US borders. Under the FDPR, 
even foreign companies using the American tools, like TSMC in China's Taiwan province and ASML in the Netherlands, were barred from supplying Huawei without Washington's approval. This was an extraterritorial projection of the U.S. domestic law into the global supply chain, so-called long-arm jurisdiction. The open markets were turned into a gated hierarchy, with Washington acting as both rule maker and gatekeeper. It overrides sovereignty, criminalized the ordinary commerce, and set a precedent that the U.S. reserved the right to weaponize any knot of the supply chain ecosystem anywhere in the world as long as American interests, however vaguely defined, were involved. So the era of constructive engagement in U.S.-China relations was over. What followed was not a single sanction, but a layered containment toolkit with one clear objective, freeze and, where possible, roll back China's tech rights on every front across the world. So Washington moved first on hardware. The sweeping export controls hit the logic chips, memory, and AI accelerators. In the product terms, the sequence was clear. NVIDIA's H100 chips were first restricted in 2022. The follow-on parts like the H20 were halted or pushed behind license walls. These technical limits were calibrated with one purpose, to cripple China's ability to train and deploy the frontier models, from supercomputers to autonomous weapons. Then came the pressure on allies. The U.S. also leaned on the Netherlands, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan through quiet diplomacy, blacklists, and supply chain leverage to fall in line with Washington's consensus, their so-called consensus. The human capital was also cut off. Chinese nationals in the U.S. labs and fabs were sidelined. Visa approvals and renewals stalled for the researchers in quantum and advanced chip manufacturing. A new anti-China panic spread across American academia. So collaboration with the Chinese institutions, no matter how technical or apolitical, was recast as a security risk. Scientific exchange was reframed as potential espionage. Washington did not stop at tools and people. It also moved on the capital. Using the uh, CFIUS, it blocked the Chinese investment in American chip startups and tool makers. Then a new outbound investment screening regime aimed to choke off the U.S. private equity, venture capital, and pension funds from fueling China's tech capabilities. In effect, America has weaponized the Wall Street itself, replacing its advertised openness and neutrality with the loyalty tests. At the design layer, the screws also tightened again. The access to the EDA tools was further restricted around the U.S. anchored triopoly. The IP cores from ARM, a British firm, and the imagination technologies faced tougher licensing paths. Even the open architectures like the RISC-V suddenly came under new scrutiny. And all of this was wrapped in a ready-made story that China's tech ambitions were an illegitimate expansion, something out of bounds that had to be contained, of course, by Washington standard. America's ship war was designed to constrain China. But the deeper irony is this. The harder Washington weaponized the chip stack, the more the cost bounced back onto its own production base, its allies, and its capital channels. So the collateral damage lands at home in Washington. The poster child of America's reshoring ambition, the TSMC's Arizona Fab, sold as a $40 billion monument to tax sovereignty, has turned into a case study in misalignment. Construction delays, union management friction, and the shortage of qualified workers, out of sequence tool deliveries, scrambled installation windows, and ramp plans. Hundreds of engineers had to be flown in from Taiwan province just to retrain the local teams on the basic FAB protocols. By the year 2024, timelines had slipped by years. As one executive put it bluntly, this is like burning cash in the desert in Arizona. So Washington's allies are also paying the price as well. The South Korea Samsung and SK Hynix with major footprints in China now live under rolling waivers and constant compliance reviews. 
because now they face a brutal strategic dilemma. They defy Washington or walk away from some of their most profitable production bases in China. Japanese equipment makers like Tokyo Electron have also lost access to a booming Chinese customer base. Then the uh, ASML, the crown jewel of the uh, semiconductor equipment, has been barred from exporting its EUV lithography machines to China. Far from building a unified technology alliance, the US is coercing compliance and leaving its allies to observe the commercial fallout. Even America's flagship chip design houses like NVIDIA, AMD, Qualcomm are also uneasy right now because the same rules that block the Chinese customers also limit their ability to scale and to learn from the high volume deployment. These are called learning curves. The US financial institutions have been pulled into this enforcement chain. The outbound investment screening has chilled venture activity not only into China, but into any firm with even a thin China link. The index providers have been quietly pressured to strip the uh, Chinese chip makers out of the global ETFs and benchmarks. It sounds crazy, right? Here is more. The most insidious effect is the erosion of global trust on supply chains. The European companies worry that they would be the next. The Indian firms, they see the front shoring as a pretext for political leverage. The ASEAN countries hedge because they are afraid of becoming the pawns in someone else's escalation spiral, mostly done by Washington, of course. So Washington's claim that it is protecting global values is increasingly read as what it is. It's an attempt to preserve the US dominance over the technology and supply chain stacks. But the narrative is, is losing its charm. Whatever moral high ground once existed has been buried under the export licenses, political waivers, and legal pressures. So decoupling was supposed to isolate China. In practice, it is isolating the United States from its allies, from global capital, and from the very openness that once built its tech sector. The question now is no longer who controls the uh, most choke points today. It is which system can observe the shocks and still function 10 or 20 years from now. Fundamentally, Washington defines winning as leading at the uh, two nanometer node, dominating global IP and sitting on the key choke points, which it doesn't, by the way. But Beijing's definition operates on a different level. Winning means making sure no political decision in Washington can erase China's technological sovereignty. That means building enough domestic tooling to keep the Fed running in a crisis in any sort of contingency, and winning enough markets outside the US to sustain the scale, and constructing the legal and logistical infrastructure to keep the machine turning even under siege. The mature knots. 28, 45 nanometers are the foundation. These chips power roughly 70% of the global electronics, from electric vehicles to industrial machinery, and they offer huge volume leverage. China's own companies, the domestic fabs like CIMIC, SMIC, Huahong, Next Chips, they have ramp capacity with local government financing, land grants, and central coordination. Advanced packaging, including the 3D stacking, has been pushed hard to squeeze more performance out of the chips without relying on the very latest lithography EUV machines. On the design side, the EDA firms like the X-Epic have been scaled up through um, state-owned enterprise contracts and partnerships with the Chinese universities. In specialty materials and gases, domestic suppliers are also being subsidized and pulled into vertically integrated supply chains. Tool makers such as AMAC and Nora have made steady gains in the uh, technology and deposition equipments, backed by the procurement quotas and aggressive talent recycling from foreign firms. Cut off from the US led tech stack, China has widened its market perimeter across the global south. And that is a key here. Huawei's Harmony OS now runs on millions of devices in Southeast Asia, ASEAN nations, Africa, and Latin America. Alibaba, Tencent, and Dahua have planted cloud platforms and city-scale systems in countries that are wary of the US surveillance. The more Washington tries to tighten the knots, the more it forces China to build a parallel system designed to survive without Washington itself. 
America clearly has already lost where it matters the most on the institutional timelines. Because China runs on a long horizon technology policy that is willing to trade the short term losses for durable control over the compute, tools, and talents. The Chinese firms operate with the state backing that tolerates failure in exchange for the uh, strategic position. When a Chinese startup fails, it isn't stripped away for the parts and thrown away. It is harvested. The IP will stay inside the ecosystem. Teams are rehired into other projects, so the capacity gets reassigned. The learning curve just continues. It never resets. The Western tech system, on the other hand, works very differently. It is very unreliable. The priorities will swing with election cycles. Funding rises and falls with quarterly earnings from the Wall Street. The risk appetite is also set by short-term returns. Even the national strategies like the U.S. Chips Act are the hostage to the partisan gridlocks, budget ceilings, and legal challenges. So two sides are operating on very different clocks. In the Silicon Valley, the capital chases returns. In China, capital follows the mandate. So the semiconductor push in China is embedded into a 20-year arc, woven through five-year plans, the 2035 industrial agenda, and the 2049 vision of technological sovereignty. Under that umbrella sits a dense institutional machine, the state-led funds such as the National Integrated Circle Industry Fund, or called the Big Fund, provincial vehicles that provide land, tax rebates, and joint venture platforms, then the ministry industrial sponsors back in sensitive fields like EDA, photonics, and secure chips, the state-owned enterprises and financial conglomerates supplying the patient equity guided by the policy signals instead of quarterly guidance. That structure de-risks the long-term bets in a slow payoff domains like EUV tools, high-purity chemicals, quantum materials, because they are areas that would be commercially impossible under a purely Western model, the so-called free markets. While the US firms fight for engineers with stock options and campus recruiting, China treats the semiconductor talent as a strategic asset. Dozens of Chinese universities now run on dedicated the um, integrated circuit institutes, the fast track with funding from education and industries. Talent programs like Southern Talents and Qimin Talents, they actively pull in overseas PhDs with labs, with housing, and clear tracks. And many of the Chinese chip companies are also co-run by the professors from Chinese Academy of Science and other top institutions, blending research and deployment inside the same pipelines. This model does not maximize the short-term output. It maximizes the vertical integration of knowledge from state labs to production lines to the strategic end users. Meanwhile, the Western techno-nationalism under both Biden and Trump still runs through this market logic. Incentives are carved out by lobbying. The fabs get built where the tax breaks are the richest. Their so-called strategy must pass the legal challenges environmental reviews, and media cycles before it can even start. So the cheap war is no longer a race up to a shared ladder. It's a test of which system can adapt faster, insulate deeper, and survive longer. In that long game, China is not simply playing catch up. It is playing by a different rule book altogether. When China builds, it builds to outlast disruption of any kind at any cost. Thanks for watching, and this is Curtis at Sinopolitik. See you next time. Stay tuned.